Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host Agostino. This is episode number 136. <laughs> and if you're wondering why my voice sounds so muffled right now, it's because I've actually decided to put this banner club or woolly hat over my face in an effort to look like some of my draw rap brethren out there. I know, I know, I look like a rapper that you haven't heard about that's fucking amazing and does all these fucking hand signs and dances the same way and always raps like this and goes back and uses bait syllables in there, rhymes. But it's actually me underneath this, it's not a draw rapper, it's me, man, it's me, Agostino Zinger. And welcome back to Agostino Zinger, show number 136, we're back, we're post-Christmas, post-Christmas celebration. I know I didn't give you guys a Christmas message, so I'm going to give you a message from my boy, my confidant, my guy, the one that I love, the one that gave me the inspiration, the one and only Uncle Pat, known as Patrice Ever, decided to do a Christmas, uh, you know, a message for all of us out there, and I'm going to play it for you guys, so you guys can have a message, and you guys can hear exactly what it means to be the Christmas spirit, and if we can get into the show. Let's go, Christmas Pat, tell us what's going on. This is Mr. I love this game, Christmas Day speech. I hope you're all listening, even you, my queen. Don't be jealous, I just want to share. What a crazy year. I've been dressed up as an Easter bunny, playing with the kids in hospital. I drove my own London taxi, even when I see Sir Alex Ferguson, he always asks me, Patrice, why you didn't come with the taxi? Maltese ahead, been snoring all the year. I beat Michel Roux, a famous chef, to make my best bolognese. And I won't mention You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone for the love, the happiness I've been sharing in 2018. And don't forget, guys, to love this game. <laughs> Merry Christmas. And I am the real Santa. So don't be jealous. And we're back. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show. It's me, your host, Agostino. I had to take that banner card off my face because it was sweating like anything. And I think, um, in general, that's not something that's going to be my every my uh, lifetime. You see, you look at some of these drill rapper guys, right? And you see what they're doing when it comes to like putting a banner club over their face when they're rapping all the time through to kind of, you know, um, exude this, uh, um, this idea that they're on the run, that they have like the, you know, the ops are after them. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigations after them, even though they're from the UK, whatever it may be. No, the whole Bernard run adds an, as a layer of mystery. You know, it, it gives people something to talk about when your music isn't giving them enough things to talk about anyway. You know, these ancillary, auxiliary things that add on to the fact that you have no talent. That is nothing that we don't need to go into that. But just the pure, legit, the pure, like, practicalness, the le- it's not the most practical thing in the world, especially, like, a woolly hat banaclava. It's not really made uh, for the, it's not really, it doesn't really aid perspiration. It doesn't really aid breathing in that regard. It's, it's designed in some regard to use the perspiration coming from your head, your head as you're sweating to somehow heat up your head, right? Or to keep your head warm in some regard, right? Especially if you've got, like, a nice cashmere one. But you don't really regard, you don't really decide to put them over your face or to cover your mouth with them although you do see some girls sometimes when they go out they have those massive kind of zara scarves and wrap around their head uh, like a hijab that usually sometimes i think as well how do you breathe because i'm not i'm just not that kind of guy when i get hair stuck in my mouth i just have to like spit it out i have to get it out you know some people that have hair on their mouth on their lip and just continue talking to you like nothing's going on i can't do that if i've got something on my face on my lip on my eyes i've got to get it off i have to do that before i can communicate with you clearly even though it's probably struggle to communicate with you clearly as you've seen through 136 episodes of this podcast communication is probably one of the things that i struggle with the most but that aside i don't i don't i don't get it i don't get how to do the whole mask thing and if you're wondering why i'm suddenly talking about drill because i went back home in it went to see my family over the weekend um because it's christmas and somehow we all led to believe that because it's christmas we have to kind of celebrate it with the people that we love or we supposedly love you know you know you got your family you can't really choose them they're just there so you kind of have to love them for what they are um (laughs) no i love them i can't really say that can i um but yeah it was nice to see my parents um for a while i haven't seen them for a long time even though we've lived you know not too far from each other like half an hour distance but you know once you get once you get old enough 
and you start and you move out and you get your own life the last thing you want to do is sit down with your parents and have them net out your ear off right but then when, when you get in a room with your parents and you're talking to them you're reminded man oh i love these guys man now i know why i like spending time with them now i know why i lived at home until i was fucking 21 years old and didn't move out when i was 18 like a normal person right now i know why because you know they can be annoying but they have got some good things about them you know they, they're quite funny they get your humor it's just nice just to like maybe because it's all the whole um what would you call it? Maybe it's because of the whole going out thing and, you know, when you're at work, you somehow get a false sense that maybe the people that you're working with are your friends and stuff. But it's good to be reminded sometimes. Number one, when you hang out, oh, I've got so much, uh, what do you call it, mucus in my nostrils, haven't I? This again. Anyway, it's nice to be reminded when you go home that there's people that you know that just know you, that just get who you are. You don't need to, there's no false pretenses. There's no having to pretend you're someone that you're not. There's not having to uh, talk about things you're interested in or to bring people on your side. You can just be exactly who you are from minute one. And that's, that's, that's so, um, uh, that's so underrated. I guess that's why some people on social, you see a lot of people doing this thing where they tr- they overly state how many years they've been friends with somebody. I've been friends with this person for 10 years, 15 years, uh, right? Like, you know what I mean? Wanking themselves off, right? That friendship wank. It's a bit annoying and it's very cringy, um, uh, I think. But I kind of get the sentiment, right? The idea is that this person has known me before I was cool, right? And they're still my friend which kind of is a bit of like a diss and a bit of a pat on the back, right? So you're dissing the people out there who have only seen friends, right? They only hang out with people when they see them in Fashion Week, when they see them at a trade show, when they see them at whatever design exhibit that's happening at that time, right? But outside of that, they're not actually friends, right? When that person's going through real life shit, those people that you hang out with that dress cool and that get pit- photog- pictures taken of them, they're nowhere to be found. Now, in some respects, that is you can't blame that on... Uh, who can blame that on? You can't blame that on anyone, right? That's just a, a ma- that's just a, that's just what happens in life, right? Sometimes you know things. Sometimes people are not not. Sometimes you know not everyone's gonna be there for you at the time of need that you want them. Even your closest friends, things can happen. You can. I, I think sometimes as well, expecting people to be there for you all the time. It, it, you know, it, it, it's it's a it's never kind of form of vanity. It's never maybe form of like showing that your ego is a bit out of control that you think your problems deserve everyone's time can be a little bit crazy but again i can understand the sentiment i just think there needs to be maybe a, a kind of realization a kind of growing up in the scene collectively to understand that i think we've seen a lot happen now i think with the whole kanye west stuff i think people have kind of weirdly recognized that kanye west has every all the right people around him right but still kind of spews out like uninformed uh ill thought out opinions right tries to get himself involved in politics when he has absolutely no knowledge of it whatsoever I'm not one to say that you should come into anything super prepared and have all your dots, have all your I's and your T's crossed, but at least do some rudimentary research. At least read into a little bit what you're talking about. He just came out, started firing off the hip about black people uh, being 400 years enslaved in the mind and need to let go of it and all this sort of nonsense and talking about how Donald Trump is his father figure because he's grown up in a household where it's just like purely women energy. It's like, what are you talking about? Just complete nonsense, right? He wasn't really, he doesn't, a bit um, incoherent. But you'd hope, but what, what I think we've seen on the on the flip side of the Kanye West thing is that he's got all these amazing cool friends around him who are only there when they want to get their clout off, right? When they want to get their little CV notifications popping, when they want to add to their kind of list of projects they're going to add on to their website. That's when those guys are there. When it's like real life shit happening in politics, they're all... They're all quiet as fuck. They're all fucking numb. When it comes to them going to Wyoming and all that shit, imagine all the people that are Wyoming, right? That went and did that whole run, right? They went to Wyoming. They went to uh, Brooklyn. I think it was in Brooklyn to do the last thing under the bridge. They went to Tiana Taylor's thing when they came back to Harlem and did the whole like Vogue thing. I think it was a dance. I think it was a Vogue thing. It was like a nightclub. But imagine all those people that went to all those activations, right? Free activations to do with Kanye and his album outputs. Where were they when he was talking about politics? Where were they when he was talking all that incoherent stuff? Where were they, where were they when the media was attacking him? Where were they when he was getting backed by the likes of Candace Owens and all those kind of loonies, right? They were nowhere to be found. They were just numb as fuck. So that, I think that, that, that goes to show that the whole friendship thing that you know of, oh, my friend, da, 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 you have to kind of um, readdress what, you have to kind of rethink what you, what you uh, classify as friendship, especially coming into a new year. You know, there's all these things about goals and aspirations, what I want to do and stuff. But I think sometimes less is less um, focus is put on the idea of like 
cultivating the space around you for the new year like what things are you going to get rid of what are the things you're going to add in your life and maybe that's one of those things you have to look at maybe that's one of those things you have to kind of really examine closely like are the friends that you have around you are they your friends or are they just convenient friends because they you both without saying it have have come come to the realization that you both serve a purpose you know the girls that you know she's a propaganda director at nts you work at phonica records so it makes sense for you to keep friends because you know you can scratch each other's back in terms of guest list you can help each other out to recommend new, new, new music but strip away all that ancillary strip away all that creative stuff and get to the real basis of the core of it are you both friends do you like hanging out with this person do you want to are you uh, interested in making sure that their mental and physical well-being is paramount to you every time you meet them do you are you catching up with them about i don't know things to do with their family outside of work outside of internships outside of all that cool shit do you are you curious enough to know about what's happening with their parents what's happening with their brothers and sisters do you spend time away from the scene that is just do anything cool and just catch up about life shit Does it make you happy when you find out uh, that they've done something really amazing and they've got a promotion? Does it fill you with, with absolute undue happiness that one of your friends has finally achieved their goals? Or do you get a little bit envious? Or do you get a little bit jealous? You have to really recal re recalibrate what you judge as friends. I've always kind of been on that kind of lane anyway, and not to pat myself on the back, but I've always kind of had that kind of thing in me. But mostly because I've kind of, I've, I've uh, as a negative, I've kind of, purposely put my pulled myself away from any of those kind of situations um at a time when i could have probably exploited my um quote unquote scene celebrity a little bit more i purposely like ducked out i purposely stayed in stratford i purposely stayed in canada i was living back at home i didn't really go out i didn't do anything right um i didn't really attend things for a long 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 time but that kind of immediately took me out of the game but I was also aware of it. You know, it's the kind of thing you have to be aware of. Like, if you decide to move away to another place to kind of build your creative commune somewhere else, right, to kind of pursue your interest in another village or another town, wherever it may be, you have to also accept that the time you spend away, when you come back, nothing will be the same. The position you had, the friends you could, you know, the friends you had, it will all change. You have to realize, and I think I was very comfortable with that I didn't mind, I didn't mind pulling away from my sanity and also I didn't mind pulling away just in general because I felt shitty. I felt a little bit disgusting, you know, having to talk to people, having to ask people questions, ask people favors who I generally didn't like, right? Who I generally thought were the, you know, were the scum of the earth. Who I generally thought I, you know, if if I saw them, you know, burning in the middle of the road, I wouldn't, I wouldn't douse them with water. Do you know what I mean those kind of people? Not the ones that are annoying. That you know, the, those people you have in your life, regardless, they could be your real friends. You have real friends that are annoying, but you still love them. But people that you just don't, you have utter contempt for, just utter, utter, utter pure contempt. And then now you're in a, an arena, in a scene arena where you kind of have to, you know, pretend like you're friendly. You kind of have to pretend like you're friends because there's only so many opportunities. You don't want anyone else to get step, uh, to jump over you or to step on your toes. But now with the advent of internet, with the advent of things like this, I'm talking into a webcam, into like a cheap USB microphone, with the advent of social media, you don't need to do that anymore. There's no gatekeepers. You can just, you can just live on your own little island and pump out content pump out loads of creative shit make your t-shirts uh make your flyers uh do your comedy sketches um i don't know do your makeup tutorials in a comfort of your own room without talking to anyone without having to be involved in that circus and you'll be fine of course there's some negatives to it right you have to give up a lot of like um personal communication and that kind of friendship building and you know uh we are by nature social animals so there is a bit there was going to be a need of you to actually talk to somebody and communicate which then goes back to the idea of having real friends right if i could have one or two real friends and then have no seed friends i'll take it in an instant in an instant in a flash i'll take it i'll stop your hand off like one or two friends that have no idea what hype this is who have don't care about resident advisor who don't care about all that shit and just you know just talk about regular shit with regular regular stuff they saw on the daily mail website or whatever it may be right run on the mill stuff and have no seen friends and just do my stuff i'd do it instantly and i think more people need to have that kind of way of thinking because well, then what happens is that even if you do decide to get cd friends you have you have a you have a kind of a what do you call it you have some entry requirements for a friend that 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 doesn't include any of the caution they might give you yeah i don't care you're the nike energy marketing assistant whatever i don't care about that shit you're gonna have your requirements that will that they will need to meet in order to be your friend now if they don't want to do that that's all well and good but you have them already instead of going into the scene uh 
uh, getting this weird false idea that these guys are your friends because they're sending you emails and shit, not knowing that they're only doing it because you work at this place or because you're friends with he or she, right? And then suddenly when it comes to a point where you need them for a friend thing, whether it's, I don't know, like I don't do this sort of stuff. Imagine you want to lend some money. Imagine you want to ask for something to do with life stuff. I don't know. Whatever it may be, right? You, I don't know. Like say you're your girl and God forbid you have to get an abortion or some shit or you're a guy and you need to go into for some surgery or some stuff. Like, I, I guarantee you, the friends that were actually going to come with you, like, let's imagine a surgery, a regular surgery, a regular tonsillitis thing. Not the biggest surgery in the world, but something that will require your, a friend of yours being able to put you into a cab, take you home, tuck you into bed, order some food for you, maybe make you a soup and leave that with you and then let, and then let you go to sleep. Like that kind of just like regular care at the end of it. How many of your seed friends do you think will come out, will come and do that with you? Not that many, I think. Just because it's not convenient, right? It's on a Thursday, they got, got to a gallery event and shit. Imagine your friend that uh, goes to you for uh, for pre for post surgery uh, care because they're going to a private view. Duh, Jesus Christ, I'd be so pissed. Imagine how pissed you'd be. <laughs> they they ghosted you for a private view, right? And if you've been to a private view, you know they're amazing, they're cool. Don't get me wrong. Even if you like the artist, it's a cool thing to go to. Yeah, I get it. But once you've been to one, my G, you've been to them all, man, right? It's the same thing all the time, right? Four walls, a bit of artwork and some free drinks. It's the same thing. And they ghost you because, of, because they want to go to Africa because you never know. That one event they go to, they might meet he or she who might co-sign them and give them a job. And get... <sighs> it's annoying. And the reason why I bring this up, because when I went to back to my mum's, talked to my little brother's, and we couldn't be more opposite of personalities if we tried. We couldn't be more opposite. That's why it's a beauty. I just look at him and just like, wow, you're so so amazing. How we're, we're, we're related. We've got so much love for each other, but we're so different. Um, in temperament, like, he's all about his friends. Both of them, they're all about their friends. All they talk about is friends, 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 friends. Hang out with their friends. They stayed at home for like a few hours and they then they uh, one of them left to go hang out with his friend, right? At Christmas Day to take some food and hang out with their... Do you know I mean? It's all about friends. Like, everything's to do with a flipping friend. They do anything for their friend. He's giggling on the phone as he's texting his friend, exchanging voice notes. I'm like, oh my God. I, cu I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear it. I just can't do it. I couldn't bear it. And again, I just think it's a, it's a, general, it's a, it's a person's makeup. I've, I've got, I've got, I begin to realize that it's just one of those things, you're just born with it or you're not. And it's, it's weird because I think my, the way I am with that whole, with social events and the fact that, and the fact that I like to go out on my own a lot and I like to have my own space, you'd think that would be something that would, uh, you'd think I was an only child the way I go on about it, but I'm not, right? I, I'm one of three. So it's like, I, I really shouldn't be like this. I really should be a little bit more, you know, willing to like be collaborative or to like hang out and shit, right? But not really. I don't would rather not. Rather just do the stuff I like to do and then go about my life. You know what I mean? Um, but you know, you do those these things when you got when it's Christmas time and everyone's pretending like they're having a whale of time with their family. It's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You know what I mean? Come on, fuck off. Fuck out of here. We'll tolerate our families. We love them and stuff, but we just tolerate them. It is what it is, isn't it? But apart from that, Christmas was fucking awesome. Had some amazing food. I know, I know it doesn't sound like it, but Christmas was good. I had some really good food. I brought back a, a whole party pack full of goodness that I've got. That's going to last me until maybe the next week. Um, most of it is carb heavy though, so I'm going to have to wait and to eat it until the weekend. I got loads of rice and shit, but my mom gave me some nice chicken that she made on the... Um, she built this little drum... No, she or she built one, but then she bought one later. But she, before she she built like a uh, a barbecue grill uh, made out of an oil drum. So you kind of cut it, you kind of cut a hole in it. I don't know, whatever you do with it, kind of like a I don't know how you do it, but my mom basically did that and kind of made a barbecue uh, chicken thighs and shit, which look amazing, which smell amazing. You know when you know when chick you know when food is tasty when it's cold and you can smell it and it's like it, it smells amazing. So it's in the fridge. It's cold. I opened the bags a minute ago. So I know when I've chucked that into the oven, I'm not going to put it in the microwave because the microwave is going to kill it. It's not going to be tasty. I try not to heat myself up in the microwave anymore. I try to like, un unless I'm like, you know, uh, really starving and I've got no time to waste, I'd rather just put it in the oven and really heat it up properly so it kind of tastes nice. But I know when I put that in the oven and reheat it, it's going to be fucking scrumptious. So I can't wait to dig into those barbecue, barbecue uh, chicken fires. I've also got some uh, spare ribs. Um, I've got a couple onion bhaji my mum decided to make, which was fucking tasty as fuck i don't know why she tried to make them but i'm not complaining um with a good potato content as well because i'm not sure if onion budget i made like this in general if they're just always onion 
and no, and no potato. But whenever I've had them in like a proper um, Indian place, I guess that's how they make them. There's not there's probably more onion than there will be potato. My mum made it the other way around. There's more potato content than onion content, so you get a nice little kind of nugget of like fried potato with like loads of nice onion in it. It's like oh, so nice, so so good. So I'm gonna jump into that. I'm gonna jump into that um, later on. But yeah, good Christmas. Happy has passed now. I guess for some people it's probably a bit of a lonely time, right? Especially if you have got haven't got any family, or if you're on bad terms with your family and shit. It's another reminder of it. And social media doesn't help with that. Um, luckily, I haven't been using it this whole time for like maybe a month or so. I haven't really been logging in or checking stuff. But I'd imagine if you're on the street, if you're on your feed, see people post pictures of their dinner, what they're eating stuff. It used to be funny when I was on it a lot because you'd always judge people's dinners, right? You'd be like, what the fuck? You guys are suffering, man. This is what you eat for Christmas. But I guess if you're suffering emotionally from Christmas, maybe the best idea is maybe to kind of lock off, lock your phone off and kind of like, you know, uh, come back to it after Boxing Day because everyone's going to be posting their pictures of like what they bought in the box and they sell so that might be a good time to jump back onto the whole uh, social media stuff but yeah overall it's been a good it's been a good um it's been a good christmas good holiday spend some time with them hang out with my brothers a little bit and now we're here um gearing up gearing up nicely to the new year's eve new year's eve is going to be a an interesting occasion for for me or part of me because this time it falls on a it falls on a Monday, doesn't it, right? And I've got the weekend coming up, so I'm DJing on a Friday, Saturday. So I think for once in in a long, long time, because I quite like New Year's Eve. I just don't like to go to a nightclub. I just like going out. I just like being outside. If I could go, it's weird. My my perfect New Year's Eve, right? Not even hanging out in people's houses and shit. Um, not that. But if I could just go outside and walk around with a couple of friends and just like. Uh, people watch and chat shit and drink a little bit on the street and stuff and have some weed, right? I mean, and just walk around and just, I don't know, just in the ambience. I do that all day long. I think I like the ambience. I like the fucking energy of it. I just don't, I don't like being inside of it. Like, for instance, like, when I go to Shoreditch and stuff, or if I, if I, if, if, I, if I ever go there, I don't go there that often anymore. When I go there, I have like a, my emotions are kind of split. And one in one case, when I'm walking down from Liverpool Street, I'm like, oh fuck, you know, man, this place has changed for the worse. It's fucking horrible. Look at these people who have come here. Like, do you know what I mean? They're all girls. There's girl. There's like gangs of girls walking down the street with bottles of rosé in their hand, getting absolute slaughtered. There's guys in it, maybe even worse state. Just a bit of a hellhole, right? But then some. But other times, I'm like, you know what? This is fucking cool as fuck, right? I remember, I remember a few years ago I used to come out here on a Friday, Saturday. It used to be fucking dead, as apart from maybe two or three venues. Now the whole strip from, let's say, from not even Tesco, from maybe further up, maybe from like uh, those kind of uh, barber shops that are near the traffic lights, from that place all the way down, past of Tesco, past all of that shit, right? It's fucking jumping, jumping, jumping. Not including Curtin Road all that area. It's 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 insane how busy it is now. And I like the ambience of it. I like just being around it. I don't now. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to go into any of those clubs. I don't want to go into any of those bars and places like the Blues Kitchen and all that sort of shit and Dragon Bar. I'd rather not go in there. It's too busy. You know I mean, there's too many people in there. It'll kind of freak me out. Um, whatever. But I just love being around that energy. And if I could do that at New Year's Eve, I'd, I'd, I'd snap someone's hand off. I think that's what I'd like to so just hang around and walk around. But again, it's too cold. It's too cold. Too, too, too cold to do that. And, you know, it's not something generally a plan that people would want to do. Oh, you, what, do you, what are you doing New Year's Eve, man? Oh, um, nothing. What are you doing? Um, nothing, man. Do you want to go out to, do you want to go out to flip in East London, the cool part of East London, and just hang around and walk around the street and see people dressed up nice going into their places and take the piss out of them and then drink and, and, and smell some weed and shit? Nah, I'm good. All right, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, no one wants to do that. It's such a weird plan to do, but that's what I'd like to do if I, if I had the choice. Um... But I think this time round might be a couple of drinks in a bar somewhere. I uh, might be hanging out at home. But what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So this is the one of the rare ones. Actually, I didn't blow my nose before I continue. So like coffee and working out. You know what I mean? But what I think really helped out, especially with the cold, is the neti pot. I've been using that a lot these days. Uh, before when I was using it, I didn't put the salt in it, but now I've been using a lot of the sea salt. I think it's the Himalayan sea salt. Himalayan sea salt? It's some kind of sea salt. It's really, really fine. So you put that into the water and you kind of mix. Usually I, I use a bit of lukewarm water just so it kind of dissolves quicker and then kind of stir that into neti pot and then kind of pour it into one nostril into the other. And it's another technique I saw on YouTube where you kind of think before you pour, you kind of hold one. No, sorry. You pour and you hold one nose and you kind of blow it out. You can do it that way. 
either way um, it kind of really helps to clear your sinuses and kind of makes you feel amazing and you hear so much better as well once you clear your sinuses your hearing kind of picks up you start hearing like a dog you hear everything I mean you just like a meerkat turn left and right but this is what I was saying to New Year's Eve this is one of the first New Year's Eve um, where I'm going to be DJing uh, prior or it's, the, it's, a, it's kind of the advantageous New Year's Eve I think for ravers or for people that like to go out a lot to, to clubs especially like I do right um I think this is probably the best one because it falls on the Monday and it's a weekend before that. So effectively, if you're really about this life and you actually want to have a good New Year's Eve party and you actually want to go out raving, which I don't want you to actually want to do because I'm DJing anyways, I can't. But if I did, if I wasn't, I wouldn't do it anyway because, you know, you always have to pay like a markup on the prices and shit. But if I was you and I really wanted to go out, I would go out on the Friday or the Saturday and have that be my New Year's Eve and just spend the whole of that uh, tube, Sunday, Saturday, so Sunday in at home, Monday at home, Tuesday at home, and then you start think work on the Wednesday, right? I think the second everyone starts work. That's what I would do. Instead of going out on this New Year's Eve, and then you know you're hungover on the New Year's Day, and then it carries over to New Year's to the second, and you're still kind of groggy. I'd rather just if if you were serious about going out, you wanted to go out, get on it, have a good time, go out Friday, Saturday. That's what I would do personally. I think that's the perfect time. That's the kind of that separates the fucking professionals from the amateurs. All the amateurs, they go out on the bloody New Year's Eve and they kind of, you know, the amateurs go out on New Year's Eve, number one, which is the no-no, like properly go out to a nightclub. And number two, they go out on New Year's Eve at like 10 p.m., right? 11 p.m. sometimes maybe. So they go out super late, expect to get into a club, expect to pay £10 like they usually do every other day of the year, not knowing that it's, you know, it's New Year's Eve. It's the one time when the clubs can, can overcharge everything from the flipping entrance fee to the drinks in the bar and people won't bat an eyelid because they want to get fucked and have that 10, 9, 8, 7, whatever moment they want, right? So they can get away with it. So not only do they go on a day, they go they go to a nightclub and they go late and expect to get that same level of service. What you should be doing is going on a Friday, Saturday. Go Friday, Saturday, pick any bar. Pick exactly what I would do even if I was, if I was on it like Sonic. I would go to a bar or a pub that happened to have a DJ, happened to have like a live band playing, right? Or like a jukebox, which you don't really have that many of. So that's the thing that annoys me sometimes about places, right? Part of the fun of going to a pub, but I guess it's not part of pub culture. Pub culture essentially is just sitting into, in a pub, like quiet, um, in, in silence, sorry, not in, not in silence, but like with no background music on, just like the sound of people talking. But what I think would really elevate pub culture, and again, I'm not I'm not someone to kind of give people advice on what pub culture should be elevating and shit. Or maybe I am, maybe I am, who knows? Maybe all these years of going out, I've kind of earned my stripes. But I think one of the best things, one of the, a great addition to the whole pub landscape would be if they had like a jukebox in the corner of a pub, right? Where you could play some tunes or whatever, and you could just like get that. That would be so sick. That would be so, 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 so sick. Like, imagine you go to a pub or a bar somewhere that had a jukebox, didn't have a live band or a DJ, let's say there's just jukebox in it. You just grab a couple of drinks, you and a few friends, and you just get slaughtered on the Friday, Saturday. You can get drunk as you want, right? Stumble home, and you still got four days to recover or five days to kind of get rested and get yourself acclimatized and figure out what you want to do for the new year and have your plans in place. It's the fucking perfect plan, man. Perfect. That's what I would do in a heartbeat if I wanted to do that. Again, because I'm DJing on a Friday, Saturday, I can't, but I will do it in a heartbeat. Um, I'm DJing actually Friday, Saturday, and come to think of it, actually, I did. I probably could have done it, right? I probably could have been a bit cheeky and maybe asked for more money, but I didn't for the Saturday because I'm assuming a lot of people will probably go out on the Saturday for their New Year's Eve celebration instead of, instead of the Sunday. But I'm going to... What I'm going to do for my set on Saturday at Heathcote Star, uh, for my uh, my DJ set under the moniker of Labertes, my little night at Heathcote Star, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to... Um, I'm going to prepare that set the same way I would prepare a set if I was playing on New Year's Eve, right? Because I, I was meant to be get, I was meant to be booked on New Year's Eve, but it didn't come through in the end. It kind of fell through last minute. Not last minute, but a few weeks ago. So that didn't happen in the end. But I think I'm going to just try, I'm going to try and put together a playlist that I think will work really well for a New Year's Eve set. Something that kind of covers a broad, vari a broad uh, variety of genres, but still has a kind of overlaying theme of like having a good time. I'm going to kind of get that kind of all suited and booted and ready to rock. And I'm going to kind of give that a test drive at Heathcote Star. And again, because Heathcote Star, they have CDJs, it's always a good way to kind of do that because I always like to kind of practice on there and kind of bring my USB stick and just kind of go with that kind of flow because I don't get a chance to play on CDJs that often. Because I usually bring my controller um, tapped and stuff. But I, I think I'm going to go for it. I think I'm going to do that and try and do and try to have a go with that. And again, I probably could have asked for more money. I'm assuming they would have probably given it as well. But, you know, 
you know, in the beginning stages, you just kind of get, you just kind of accept anything you're given and just try and prove yourself in the time that you have available. And then your hope, like a tools, your hope is the more time pro goes on, especially when it hits the kind of the year marker, you can kind of revise and say, Hey, I know you like what I do. Can we get an increase 50 quid, hundred pound, whatever it may be. And then you kind of, kind of, kind of go from there. But yeah, um, I'm doing that uh, Friday, Saturday. So that should be cool. A bit it, get, it gives the kind of New Year's Eve thing a little bit less of a sheen. So if I do intend to go out on New Year's Eve, it'll just be for a drink. It won't be stuff to go crazy with in yes the year. But I'm assuming people are going to be doing some mad plans in it, like booking hotels and shit coming down. It's just long in it. It's just long. It's long, 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 long. And again, just because um, it's not because of it's not because of me. I think just in general, London isn't spontaneous, isn't it? Unfortunately, with the with the with the changing in licensing laws and stuff, and play, places closing earlier. And just in general, the fact that you have to buy tickets for the stuff that you really want to go to way in advance, because usually you can't get them on the door because they're going to sell out, because they're going to um, be, I don't know, three times the price they are online and shit. Um, it, it just doesn't call for spontaneity. You can't just decide on a whim, oh, I'm going to go E1, I'm going to go Phonics, I'm going to go X or Y, because you're just going to be met with an absolute disaster of a night by the time you head over there. And then when you get over there and you queue and you get in through security, three or four pat downs, you realize you've only got three hours to rave. You know what I mean, it's just not worth the trouble. So I think that's what makes the New Year's Eve a bit annoying. And plus, New Year's Eve they don't even they don't even go on for longer. Nights still end at three a.m. It's not even like they. Some places have late licenses, but sometimes they don't. They just go. They just go on as normal. They just end at two. It's like, come on, man! It's New Year's Eve, man. Let me stay in. Let me stay here for until six a.m. But anyway, what do I know? Less about New Year's Eve and more about today. You know, can't can't compete about the future let's talk about today and the present time and let's get into some topic stuff i've seen on the interwebs that i thought was interesting that i want to talk about i've got a huge backlog of stuff actually that i want to get through let's get through it let's just jump let's just let's just jump into it right as that annoying phil defranco guy says let's just let's just jump into it guys let's just jump into it okay we got topics let's jump into it let's get it let's get it jumping let's get the party started all right, all right, all right, all right. Number one, it's over, man. Sad news for hype beasts all over the world. Hype beasts that have been bemoaning the state of sneaker culture. The guys out there that are crying into your sneakers. This is a sad, sad day in sneakerdom because Virgil Abloh has announced that the Nike 10 collection is finally over. Um, I'm saying finally because I've had enough of seeing those shoes, but I think Riv I think kind of um. Looking back on it from a bird's eye view or looking up from it from a bird's eye view or taking a step back from the whole situation, you have to really give the guy credit, man, for the collaboration overall and kind of really put in perspective what happened, right? Because I think it's, it's I think it's cool to know of Virgil now, of who he's kind of become, right? The Louis Vuitton stuff, um, the stuff with Off-White, Evian, the kind of retrospective in Chicago is happening soon, all the art stuff he's been doing at Miami, at Basel, the collaboration with Ikea, list them the dj stuff list them list them right it's long it's a long long and very list everyone knows what he's done everyone knows he's a bit of a killer but you also have to remember a few years ago maybe a couple of years ago virtual wasn't very well liked within the scene right people didn't actually like him as a person right they kind of thought he was a bit of a scumbag right and that all kind of emanated from the whole ralph loren uh pyrex vision shirts right do you remember that whole malarkey when he um he kind of uh, bought out the entire stock of a particular ralph loren or ralph uh rugby shirt kind of flannel type thing screen printed pyrex uh vision or pyrex 23 on the back of him and then marked them up by four or five times the value so i think he might cop them for like 30 quid they might retail for 120 and you sell them for like 500 dollars right and people are snapping them up but then you know in most of the time the, the conversations on forums and stuff um was that you know uh virgil's being a bit of a dick and he's talking about he's you know he's talking about he's doing it all for the kids and all that shit but that he's not really doing it for the kids when he's charging kids 500 dollars for a flannel that he found for 30 dollars so he kind of wasn't really well regarded in that respect people kind of thought he was a bit of a scumbag and kind of thought he was a bit of a charlatan right and then suddenly over the period of time, I think through his own effort as well, through his kind of, I think he kind of realized it might have been a bit of a misstep. I think he kind of did uh, uh, reverse, uh, rationalize the whole situation by saying that it was a kind of a play, it was a kind of art project and it was kind of a social experiment or whatever it may be, kind of excused that whole rationale. But I didn't think at the time it was something that he needed to do. Um, I didn't think he needed to sell those for $500. I didn't think he needed to kind of keep banging on about he was for the kids and then to turn around and kind of try and sell them a, a a shirt that he bought uh pre-made and screen printed 23 on the back of it and then sold it for 500 dollars. i don't think you need to do that right um 
and it kind of did more damage than good to his image. But I think what he realized, as all kind of great and amazing people did, or do in general, he kind of realized he made a mistake. And I, I'm just rationalizing myself. Again, I know, have no inside knowledge, right? But I would assume him being a cool dude now is that he kind of realized the fuck up that he made and made amends, right? And he kind of, and the amends that he done was just to kind of um, absolutely flood the market with fucking output. He's been probably the most prolific um, output maker on the scene that I've seen in a long, 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 long time. I think obviously stuff, people, so someone like Hiroshi Fujiwara, maybe um, A Life guy, uh, maybe even Stash back in the day when he had his, when he had these kind of run. Futura had a, a mad run where every other week he had a collaboration or a release of something coming out. But I think in terms of the scope, in terms of the range, in terms of the just general uh consistency of his output i think virgil is kind of probably um untouchable right in kind of the modern day um creative that's around in a scene and why he stands out more is because in a scene nowadays you have a lot of people especially designers especially people that are creatives who are kind of um paralyzed by um uh paralyzed by preparedness right or like they they they, they, they want to be overly prepared right they want to get things perfect before they put it put it out and it never it's never perfect right if you're a creative and you give a shit about what you're doing it's never going to be perfect that's the that's the nature of being a, cre a creative right you always think you could do better right but the no but the kind of the, what separates the kind of the greats from the good right is that they just put it out they just start saying you know what okay that's done now i'm going to move on it's out there just put it out there as it as is and Virgil's done really. Virgil's done a really good job of kind of assuming that message and kind of pushing that forward. And I think over time, just with pure will of him just putting out product to product to product, I think people have seen that. Okay, maybe he might have been a charlatan. Maybe he might have done a bit of a scumbag move with those kind of rug with those kind of Ralph uh, rugby shirts he got printed with twenty three on the back of them. But this guy knows what the fuck what he's doing. He's really talented. He's got an ability. He's got a gift. Right. He's really good at this design shit. Um, he has his finger on the pulse. He knows how to kind of like take stuff that's in the cultural zeitgeist and make it uh, profitable, right? He knows how to kind of commercialize buzz keywords, phrases, all that sort of shit, uh, artistic movements, uh, taste palette, taste levels, and kind of make it into a product, right? He knows how to do it. So he did it. But then also have to imagine the whole sneaker collaboration thing as well has kind of been a little bit rocky, right? There's been big brands just taking shoes that are available, changing colorways, not really doing that much about it, uh, or collaborations coming out that have subpar products, subpar materials, whatever. So him taking on the mantle of trying to do a Nike collaboration, right, out of the gate, right, as a first kind of sneaker collaboration, I think I think so. It's maybe the first sneaker collaboration that he might have done. There might have been, a, no, there's actually a sneaker collaboration that uh, Virgil did with Off-White with Kif, right? Do you remember those hiking boots? I think they were the first ones that were kind of like grey and pink. They might have been the first uh, kind of like footwear collaboration that Off-White did. But the first, kind or Virgil did, right? So the first kind of, oh, no, he did them on the Off-White, didn't he? Did he do them Off-White? Yeah, he did do them on the Off-White monarchy. So that might be the first collaboration, the kind of the Kif uh, boots with Off-White. I think so. Let me double check it. But to kind of come out of the gate and then decide, you know what? My first kind of collaboration that's going to hit the mainstream is going to be with Nike. And then do to do 10 shoes... That that took a whole lot of balls, I think, in my in my in my estimation. So I think we have to kind of give the guy a lot of respect for what he did, um, and the level of output. And I think now is probably the perfect time to kind of call put it on the head, right? To kind of like say, you know what? Let's just dot the i's and the t's, and we're kind of done. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I think this this might have been the first cl footwear collaboration that he put together, right? Um, let me do show. You can see here on Google Images here. So Kiff and Off White. And yeah, that's like Aaliyah, Aaliyah May, right? Aaliyah May, how do you pronounce her name? Aaliyah May, Aaliyah May again, right? In the editorial. So I think this was the first collaboration he might have done the footwear-wise. I'm assuming so. I'm not, not really sure, but this might have been. But let's say let's say the Off-Whites were the first kind of commercial, sort of like, you know, first time um, in the public eye collaboration. To do that, to come out your first collaboration, to hit at the park the way he did with the, with the Nike 10, insane man he smashed it levels upon levels and also the way he smashed it which was really well it kind of goes back to his whole de design ethos i think is it you mentioned the interview i think it might be the five percent rule like he tries to change it is it five percent right like but by, by five degrees or something along those kind of lines it was an amazing um way to do it taking kind of like you know uh very heralded designs or f uh, silhouette models from nike's archive and kind of changing them ever so slightly, right? T uh, materials, inside out, switching tongues, uh, moving the sush around, like just really subtle things. But when they come together, it's, it's unmistakable from, from afar. It reminds you of like old school, it reminds you of like old school uh, Kojo JP um, Air, um, Nikes, for instance, right? Um, 
uh, you can spot a JP, a kind of specifically like a Japanese specific model of an airport of an Air Force One, right? You can spot that off from a mile away. Number one because of the colorways. Number two because of the shape. You can just spot it off from a mile away. Sometimes even Air Max, you can spot them from a mile off. And even in later years with the Hiroshi stuff, especially with the HTM stuff, you can spot that stuff, especially the kind of the regular kind of black Air Force Ones that are maybe made with really luxurious levers, but from afar, it just look like a black Air Force One. But you can spot that shit from a mile off. That's what he done really well with the off-white collaboration. You can spot those shoes from a mile away. You can spot them shoes from a mile away. Now, it helps that some of them are, have got great colorways and them involved, but overall, it's probably one of the best collaborations of recent years. And I think... For him to end it all, this is Nike the 10. For, for, for him to end it all now, I think it's probably a perfect time. I think it was kind of getting a little bit um, oversaturated on the market. I think, you know, releases coming out every other week. They're just spotting a new pair. They're going to release for this time, blah, 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 blah. It just got a little bit too much, I think, personally, for my liking. Again, only for me. I think the sneakerheads out there are probably going to be a little bit pissed off, a little bit bummed that they're not getting any more of them, right? I think they just want the more, the better for some sneakerheads. But I think this is the perfect way to end it. And just look at the lineup, man. Forget all the. F- let's ignore the iterations that have come out now recently. But I think as the first drop of sneakers that you ever put out, right, with one of the biggest sneaker brands in the world, right, and this is what you do, it's insane, right? Maybe the only dud you can say are the. I forgot what that model is at the top there, top right. That's there's probably one dud in ten shoes. That is insane. That's an insane ratio. He's got one dud in ten shoes, and and what makes it brilliant is that. With with ten with ten shoes, there's bound to be one shoe in that collection you're gonna like, and there's bound to be one shoe in a collection that everyone dislikes, right? Um, and it'll vary considerably depending on what kind of shoe people like or don't like. Because I know for sure in London, for instance, I saw quite a lot of people uh jumping on the Air Maxes. The Air Max ninety and the Air Max ninety seven were very popular here because you know in general London or Europe for the most part is an Air Max. Um, we're Air Max lovers more so than we are kind of Jordan and kind of you know the kind of Air Force One sort of basketball inspired shoes. But they are super popular here. Now I've seen a real high resurgence of people wearing the Converse Off Whites too. Uh, they've been kind of co opted by all those kind of skater crew guys or guys just want to wear you know the kind of like our bam dressing kind of dude who kind of wants to have a little bit of pop in the bottom of his uh footwear department he picks off the off-white converses because they've still got the converse look but they're a little bit you know a little bit special you know see-through sole all that sort of shit amazing right then you've got the prestos right and he completely changed completely completely changed how prestos look right completely changed them from the way they from the way the uppers are constructed to the tongue to where the swoosh placement is the text on the strap like completely reinvented the, the the presto and made it suddenly a luxe shoe it went from being something that people just buy because they kind of look cool in a uh, in a sub during summer holiday or with shorts on right presto are probably one of the, the best shoes you can wear with kind of short shorts that kind of trend that everyone's wearing they look amazing with that kind of thing imagine like some nice paneled shorts with some nice old school um prestos with those old colorways in it especially when it's got the nice silhouette on the front of it uh, he hasn't got the kind of banana toe box they look great he kind of went from that and then all of a sudden now like you know their their marquee shoe and then you look at everything else the air force one like just insane the blazer even which is not something i'm particularly into but i think overall i think we'll probably look back on this time and think you know what Virgil absolutely smashed this collaboration like just fucking smithereens and we're gonna look back at it maybe think this might have been one of the greatest collaborations ever in terms of sneakers overall. Because you're looking at what's coming out now, you've seen like, I've seen pictures of like, um, I think Eric Costin showing a pair of the new pigeon dunks that are meant to be coming out soon. They've kind of changed the colorway or upper and kind of uh, put little, I think it's an icy sole, a see-through sole with um, kind of headline clippings or clippings of newspapers from from when the pigeon dunk came out the first time around about the cues, all that sort of shit. You see someone like uh, Jeff Staple, who, you know, highly respected guy in the scene, but you see the kind of, the amount of regurgitated designs that he's making, he's putting out there, you know, the kind of laziness that he does with his collaborations. And then you see the stuff that Virgil does, and you see the stuff that Ronnie Fake does with Kiff, and you have to give those guys applause, man. You have to kind of give them their flowers while they're still around, because they go the extra mile. You can easily just, re- you can easily just rein it in, right? And just do another pigeon dunk like Jeff De- Staple's done, which people are going to obviously lap up, right? Or you can kind of go in there and really challenge yourself. And for a, a Virgil to challenge himself and do 10 now i'm not sure how the, the deal how it kind of got uh presented to him i'm not sure whether or not nike came and said hey we want to uh do a promotion run with all these shoes in the next i don't know they kind of specced out a, a timeline of five years that they want to give all these shoes a kind of a bit of a, a bit of love during that kind of uh promotion calendar whatever it may be and they kind of so he'll be the best guy to do it because he's the mr multitask or if whoever virtual just came out the bat and said i want 10 shoes right like whatever the wh- whoever decided to do it 
they fucking smashed it anyway. The kind of output is the one. And again, I got to say, a lot of people out there, creatives there may be, who are kind of, you know, on this whole train of like only releasing PSD files of like t-shirts they want to make or of hoodies and long sleeves and all that sort of malarkey. Let's take a lesson from Virgil. You might not like what he does. You might not like some of his interviews. You might think he's a bit pretentious, whatever it may be. Well, what you cannot argue is that the man is an absolute workaholic, right? And he puts everything out. He releases stuff. Stuff is sold on a website. You can buy it. It can get shipped to you. You can have the things that he puts on his Instagram. It's not just one-off stuff that he's made for himself or stuff that he's got on the, on the PSD file sitting on his hard drive somewhere. He makes shit happen. And I think that's kind of the stuff that you've seen regularly with the people that have come making the, the leaps and bounds this year. You look at someone like Elon Musk, right, even. I think that respect has come from there. Like, you know what I mean? We've seen, the, we've seen the fruits of his labor. We've seen the fact that he's been able to show us a rough draft of what that boring tunnel is going to look like. He's shown us a rough draft. He's shown not more than a rough draft of what Tesla's going to look like, right? What space is going to look like. He's, he's, he's kind of proved this concept. And I think that's something that we kind of have to give more credit to Virgil for. But uh, going back to this Nike 10 collaboration, man, like, honestly, one of the best collections ever, man, I think overall. Um, the Jordan 1's probably still my favorite. I think that's going to go down. The Jordan 1, maybe the MX 90 might go down in kind of like a sneak collaboration history. I think overall for what they look like, especially the black MX 90 that's meant to come out soon, I think. Um, they look absolutely amazing um, in black. There's something about the way they pop in black that just it reminds me of like it reminds me of old school um, Air Max Nines I used to wear back in the day when I was in school. Especially in school, there was one I used to particularly wear that I remember I borrowed from my friend to go on the link <laughs> uh, to meet some girl that I kind of spoke to on black chat. Was super funny, but they were all black upper with no mesh or anything, right? Uh, tumbled leather with a metallic swoosh metallic silver swoosh like so good and it had that old school shape had the the mx90 the shape of yesteryear not the one of nowadays where it's got the kind of banana toe box it had that kind of flat silhouette shape on the outside so really really flat toe box it kind of literally like a, you know the vintage shoes that you see online um they back in the day that kind of had the, an absolutely flat toe box nowadays and most shoes have that kind of pointed up thing um but yeah but these look so good man in black i can't i can't wait to get a pair when they come out um, similar to the kind of black, um, the black sort of inside out Air Force ones that came out the other day in neon and all that sort of malarkey. But I think these black, these black MX nineties look the look banging. Okay, these are something else two seventies. But yeah, the MX nineties look so good in black. I can't wait to see them IRL. But yeah, overall great collaboration. Um, I think Virgil put out a little statement actually on his Instagram about the whole thing ending. I shall quickly read out here. Uh, it's a post here that's on hype beast. So it says here, a uh, small fact, personally, I'm visually obsessed with the combination of black sneaker and white swoosh with white laces, hence every edition of the last ever 10 came as such. Okay, cool. So I'm assuming what, so so are we going to get, are we going to get uh, a 10 of the, of the Jordan 1 then? I'm assuming everything is going to come in black and white, he's saying maybe essentially, which might be quite cool. Um, I think we still got a couple left, right? They're still, they're going to, they're going to ship, I think they're going to sell that uh, blue, the sort of like a uh, cobalt blue. Air Force One, I think it's going to tie in with the uh, uh, the retrospective he's going to be doing in the Chicago, um, I don't know where it is, somewhere in Chicago, he's going to do an exhibition next year, retrospective of kind of all his work so far. So for, instance, for someone to do a retrospective in six years time, right, usually six years are not that long in a creative landscape, right, you sometimes depending on how you work, you can maybe spend a year plus on a project, so you can probably only have six things to show, but in a calendar year, I'd hate to imagine, I'd hate to think of the amount of things he's made t-shirts alone right imagine the amount of stuff he's with so it'll be cool to see what retrospective looks like overall um but yeah maybe that might mean we might see everything in black and white so we might see a few of those jordans um in black and white too but yeah um i'm not i'm not mad it's ending i think maybe it was kind of coming to an end anyway i'm kind of getting a bit tired of it it's all like the easy 350s i think maybe in in design terms or in terms of what he wanted i think overall i remember hearing a few of the talks that virgil had in terms of um, the lectures and stuff i remember he mentioned like if you can't get a pair of these i want you to copy some of the things that i did in terms of taking on the swoosh moving things around you could do them with just a general a generic a generic kind of white shoe of the same model but i think overall it's not i don't think he had maybe the same um uh, I don't know, intention as maybe Kanye did with the 350s, right? I think Kanye said for the longest time he wanted everyone in the world to wear 350s, right? So even though the market has been flooded with Yeezy 350s, I think the long-term goal is to kind of have Yeezy 350s be the, the new Air Force One, right? A shoe that kind of, you know, uh, transcends any kind of celebrity and it's just like a shoe people like because it looks good with outfits, it's comfortable, blah, 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 blah. But I think the Nike 10 was a bit more of a special 
bespoke sort of product, right? A project, for instance, like it was kind of a chance for him to kind of flex his creative muscles to show that, you know, when given the resources, like I said before, with the Louis something, everyone was kind of complaining, oh, why did they give it to him for? It's not going to be good. I was like, yes, it will be good. Because we've seen what he can do on his own terms, right? It's a bit rough on the edges, right? It's a bit happy, it's a bit slapdash, but there's something there, right? He obviously gets it. He obviously has his finger on the pulse. He's obviously very, he's obviously very adept at taking what's happening in the cultural zeitgeist and kind of somehow uh, filtering it down and putting it all into a product. He's able to do that. It's a very particular talent. So if you give him the resources, if you give him the the ability to manufacture stuff at the highest level, whether it's Louis Vuitton or Nike, he's going to hit it out of the park. And we've seen it so far. But I'm happy to see they've ended it. Um, or he's ended the 10 collaboration. Of course, with Nike, because they're, they're, they have no scruples. They are definitely going to take some of the um, models that he's done and kind of iterate them out to GR level. They always do that, right? They're going to, you know, you've, you've already seen it with Nike copying the kind of deconstructed look on their on their skate highs they did recently. But for sure, you're going to see elements of the deconstructedness uh, DNA that he's kind of imbued on these collections applied to other shoes. You're going to see them kind of iterated out. So you're going to kind of see weird sort of like Fugazi-ish type looking uh, shoes that look like off-white but they're not off-white collaborations for sure but i'm happy to see he kind of reined it in and kind of said you know what that chapter's closed and we move on forward now um i will interested to see what happens going forward happy to see if he's gonna do any collaboration with other um, um sportswear brands whether or not it's just an exclusive deal with nike or if he's gonna do something with adidas i think would be quite cool even maybe kind of maybe given uh a kind of dead brand a bit of a revitalization maybe giving them um a kind of stimulus pack i can imagine like a high tech for instance who are making loads of kind of really stacked uh you know trendy shoes at the moment right they've got a couple at the moment i saw on some websites i think i saw on my own tresbian they're kind of iterating that so it might be cool to see him do a kind of high tech collaboration kind of go completely left field maybe do something with feeler that's coming out now that's you know every second girl that i see walking around and wears a pair of feelers and couldn't have been it. Everyone's got a pair of those fucking things. So that I couldn't, I could imagine that thing happening. There's a lot of scope, but I'm happy to see he kind of ended it in that regard. I'm happy to when things kind of end as well. It's good, you know, collaboration is going on for years and years and years can kind of get a little bit boring. And it also makes the stuff that you have from that collaboration a bit special, right? I've got a pair of the Jordans. I've got a pair, I've got two pairs of the Jordans, right? I've got some Air Force Ones, which I'm going to get actually soon. Sorry, I'm going to buy them soon if I actually have them in my position now, but I've got a pair of Jordans. So it's nice that I know that that thing is a bit special now, right? It's not, not everyone's going to have it. It's nice to know that. And I think going forward, um, we can just see what he does with the other projects. But yeah, that's ended. That's over. Nike 10 is done. So if you've got a pair or if you're looking to get a pair, get them now because I'm sure the price will flip in quadruple as people will start to learn that maybe it's not going to be the same again. Maybe not the same product. Maybe something else. Maybe it might start. Maybe it might go completely. Because there was a few... Maybe it might go... Maybe the next 10 collaboration might be some future models like new stuff now like the stuff has been made now right that might be a good way so they're going back to the archive and digging out old models it might be like okay let's do let's do a whole run of fucking nike 10 collaborations and stuff of like new shoes like in the models like the react 8 7s and stuff that might be a cool way to do it but who knows who the fuck knows um what else is on here john jones strikes again oh okay this is just a, a brief kind of heads up i'm sure most people know about this but um the UFC card is going to happen on the weekend. Uh, Alexander Gustafsson and John Jones are fighting again a second time. You know, the first time round, everyone kind of fought. Gustafsson maybe kind of squeezed it, but John Jones won in the end by decision. But both guys were dead on their feet, absolutely bloodied, right? It was kind of like a, the pinnacle of that kind of heavyweight division, right? Or like heavyweight division. Uh, two guys who are very skilled and kind of, you know, complement each other in terms of styles, both striking um, flipping savants in that respect, right? And John Jones had a bit of a checkered pass. It's, 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 um, it's fair to say. And um, yeah, he's supposedly popped again this weekend or before this weekend. Um, and in an effort to make sure they save the car because, you know, other uh, previous cars have been kind of hampered with the main fight uh, with the, one, of the, one of the fighters uh, missing way or getting popped for something. So, you know, Dana White is very conscious of that and the way how it, you lose money. So in an effort to kind of save the card, they decided to move it last minute to come to LA from Nevada, from Las Vegas to LA. And um, yeah, basically effectively fucked everyone over. But it's not even that that is the issue I have with it. It's just the, it's just the lying, I think, I have the issue with. It's the unprofessional nature of it. It's the kind of clear and obvious uh, favoritism um, that they have when it comes to everything comes, considering to John Jones. Like nothing like when you're the favorite when you're the cash cow of the ufc they'll do anything in their power to ensure that continues 
when you're somebody that isn't of any sort of influence or he hasn't got any sort of notoriety or any sort of weight behind your name, they come down on you like a ton of bricks. And I think with the evolution of the UFC, you know, with uh, the sale of the UFC and with the, uh, you know, and with the idea that they want to legitimize the sport and turn it into a legitimate sport, right? And have it kind of enter into the cultural uh, conversation, right, in the same way the NFL does with the general public, right, they want that, it's not like they want to just be uh, only a fight network uh, that kind of appeals to your hardcore fight fan, they actually want the UFC to kind of pop into pop culture, if you want that to happen, then you can't be running the show like this, it's kind of, it's complete amateur hour, right, it's complete amateur hour, the fact that the UFC fighters themselves, the other fighters on the card found out that the, the, the card is going to be moved to Las Vegas through social media, right? They didn't find out personally through the head of the UFC. They didn't, why didn't call them out individually and say, look, I know we fucked up. I know you're going to be pissed. I know I'm favoriting, I'm favoriting John Jones, but hope you can understand that I have to do anything in my power to save this card. Last card of the year, I can't, go, I can't have us going out like this, right? I can't have us going out like this, like bullshit. Um, we, we hold our hands up. We fucked up. You John Jones fucked up, but we're gonna move it, and I hope you guys are okay with it. Here, I'm gonna contribute a portion of the fee of the I don't know whatever the gate to your flights. I don't know whatever it may be. You thought you hoped that would happen, but it didn't happen that way. Everyone found out through social media, effectively, for the most part. John Joe, I mean uh, Dana White and Jeff Nowitzki, uh, the guy who's now in the pocket of the UFC, it seems like right when he when you saw the first came into UFC, everyone was kind of celebrating on the rooftops, thinking, "Oh, we're finally gonna get performance enhancing drugs out of the sport." But that hasn't transpired so far. I think Jeff Nowitzki is kind of maybe get he got ground down by the system, and somewhere along the line he decided to kind of you know take the money. Um, again, I'm not accusing him of taking bribes or anything, but he decided to kind of go. He decided to kind of like um, get pally pally with the UFC so much so that he supposedly has an office at the UFC Institute, right? He's he's he, he's no he, he he's no longer a contractor that works outside of the office. He works in the building, right? So it's within the interest of the UFC to kind of bring him in, but it's also within his own interest for, you know, his own kind of like, um, what would you say, um, professional integrity to not be so pally-pally and not to be in the pocket of the UFC, right? They did, did the press conference the other day. Um, Dana White and Jeff Nowitzki trying to explain away what happened to John Jones and the fact that it was just a pinch of salt in, a, in an Olympic size swimming pool and it showed up again. It's bullshit, man. We don't buy it. We don't believe that shit. If you get popped for steroids, you get popped for steroids. No matter how minuscule the amount is, it just means whatever you were doing that you were helping you get away with it. This time you didn't get away with it. You got caught, right? These guys are out here microdosing PEDs, and it happens, right? People microdose LSD and acid at work to be more creative, right? To be more cerebral, right? To, like people do that. What makes you think that UFC fighters aren't going to do it? Especially a fighter like John Jones, especially someone that's that crazy, right? That's that off unhinged, right? Someone that brilliant. If he wanted to add a little spark to his uh, arsenal of skills, right, that could allow him to improvise and to throw an elbow when someone's going to think he's going to throw a kick or whatever it may be, why wouldn't he do PEDs? Of course he would. But it's the responsibility of the UFC to, to kind of set some ground rules, right? Like if you break this rule, you're out. It doesn't matter who you are, you're out. But they don't. The rules bend depending on who it is, depending on what the fight that is, depending on what the, the projected gate might be. And it's horrible, man. It's horrible for the fighters. It's horrible for the fans who kind of, you know, imagine all the fans who made uh, their, their, setting their, their plans around UFC. Uh, so I spoke earlier about New Year's Eve celebrations, right? That I'm DJing on a Friday, Saturday, so I'm going to maybe turn it into my New Year's Eve. Cool. Now imagine if you're going to the UFC fight, the UFC fight this weekend, you're going to go to Las Vegas. Maybe you decide, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna make that be my New Year's Eve. I'm going to fly in on Thursday or fly in later Friday evening. I'm going to spend Friday uh, and maybe the whole of Saturday uh, in, in Las Vegas, um, hang out there, and maybe stretch it all the way until Monday and have New Year's Eve there, do the whole countdown. Imagine what, like, imagine what New Year's Eve must be like in Las Vegas. It would be amazing with the fireworks and all that shit. Or, or from my, come from my bedroom window or maybe from outside, whatever you may want to do. That would be so cool to do. <laughs> But now they can't do that. Now they're going to have to change their plans, get flights, book new hotels. Most hotels don't do uh, refunds this short notice, right? They might give you only 50% of your original deposit or whatever you paid. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's not like they're moving it like down the road, right? They're moving it to LA. That's like four hours away. It's insane. It's insane. And all because of one fighter. Not because of two. If it was two or three on the card, two or three on the people on the card, cool. I can understand. They want to save the card. Let's move it. But... Number one, you move it for one person. And you move it for the one person who's had a very checkered past, right? He's had a, he's kind of, you know, he's, uh, his form book has been blotched a lot by some of the things that he's done lately. And he gets given a grace. 
he gets given the benefit of the doubt. And then they try to explain it away. I don't even mind again. I don't even mind the benefit of the doubt. Actually, thinking about it, don't give John Jones the benefit of the doubt, right? He's one of the. He's one of. A, he's a. He's a once in a generation talent, right? Give him that benefit of the doubt. Cool, no worries. But don't lie to us. Don't sell us this whole idea that oh, it was something that he took eighteen months ago and still needs his system. Come on, man. What what kind of drugs is people taking and it shows up still eighteen months later? That's BS, bro. Whatever he was doing, he didn't do it well enough. Whoever his his uh. Uh, I don't know. Whoever is the guy in his team who is kind of micro dosing him with these PSDs is doing a fucking terrible job, right? Whoever it is didn't do it well, didn't have a good enough job, and he got caught. But you can't tell me he's been in the system for eighteen months. You can't tell me that. I don't believe you. I just don't believe you. I don't believe you. I categorically don't believe you. And and no one else does either. So yeah, let's see what happens. Uh, I think in general, no, nothing will change until Dana White leaves, like I've always said. Until until they change uh, who's in charge of the UFC and they get all that amateur hourish, all that kind of lack of detail stuff out of the books, it's not going to change. They've, you know, it's just, it's, it's run like an absolute shit show. Dana White kind of runs it the way he wants to run it. And now it's too big of a company for it to be run by one guy like that. Like, it, 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 it can't be run like this anymore. There needs to be change. There needs to be an evolution. But whether that will happen is never the case. Um, I think now everyone's going to be rooting for Gustafsson I think to win it will still be a tough fight I think supposedly the, the rumour is the first fight John Jones didn't train at all he trained for maybe two weeks and he was before that he was doing loads of blow and fucking prostitutes and shit and he still marginally won against Gustafsson so if you look at that you might think that if he won without training was he gonna? How's he gonna? How is he gonna perform now with everyone in his case? Because you know he's a sociopath, right? So I'm sure Judge is gonna interpret this as like people are out to get him and they don't understand all that sort of stuff. So he's gonna have a chip on his shoulder. He's gonna have something a point to prove, and he's gonna have training on the back of it. It's gonna. It might. It might be a little bit one sided. You never know. But then again, the ring rust. He's been out for a long time. Blah blah blah. blah. But I think a lot of people are gonna be rooting for Gustafson. The neutral fan is gonna be definitely want to see John Jones splayed out on the floor, knocked out of his gum sheet out of his mouth. But I don't think that's going to happen because I think they're, just, they're probably too good of a fighter to kind of let it get that um, health scale off for the most part. But yeah, that's happened. John Jones is mo- is most probably a juicy rat. Um, and yeah, nothing else we can do about it, I guess. We have to just kind of just, you know, allow Dana White and Jeff Davisky to try and explain away why he has this in the system. I love the excuses they make. It's like, you can't make it, oh, take these supplements. Oh, come on, man. Take these supplements. These guys, man. These guys. Anyway, what's next on the list? Move away from that. Let's see here. Do-do-do. Fury. Kanye West gets into a Twitter storm whenever he has something releasing. Okay, this is an old thing I had on here, but might as well kind of bring it up. Um, I guess there's a theory out there, right? That kind of alludes... To, not a theory, but I think a lot of people have been saying it. I'm not saying anything new in that regard. That the whole you know, Kanye West has kind of been a bit quiet now. He's kind of like piped down a little bit, but when he was kind of going through that thing with uh, Drake and you know talking um, mad wild on Twitter as if like Drake was threatening his life of his his own life and the life of his family, um, as if Drake was the guy from Halloween, you know, standing outside the garden, um, not moving, just staring at the window. Um, you know, the the thinking was that there was a real problem there as there has been I think people are can read between lines and realize that Kanye has always had a problem with Drake ever since he came out he kind of has done this whole fake love thing saying that you know Drake's drunk number one and he's happy to kind of pass the torch over and he's the guy that everyone wants to hear because you know I'm sure Kanye goes out or he hears the Jenners um, or the Jenners friends coming around young people and they're not really playing his music anymore right they're, they're playing like, know, stuff that's nowadays right they're playing Drake they're playing Little Baby they're playing Gunner they're playing Future they're playing current shit they're not playing uh, his stuff anymore so he, there's maybe a realization that he's maybe not as popular as he thought he would be with, with the kids nowadays um he's still popular don't get me wrong but people aren't really playing uh cardi music right now nowadays for the most part um so when he did when he did kind of be, when he kind of did begrudgingly admit that maybe drake is ahead of him you kind of did think there was a little bit of you know a little bit underneath that and he kind of has confirmed it with his tweets. But there is a theory out there that that aside, that, you know, their legitimate issues aside, that supposedly he only does this when he's got something releasing. And it seems a bit of a coincidence, right? The, the week that he had uh, that beef with Drake, I think is the week that these things came out, right? So that's the same same week you have your issue with Drake and you're tweeting at him and saying that he's going to he's gonna flip in or around that time, right? Um, it gets announced that he's releasing the 700 v2s the static ones they're fucking amazing i really like i, 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 mean, I actually want a pair man they look so cool 
right? So that that gets now. So these shoes are coming out. That's when you that's when you start beefing with Drake. So everyone's like, hmm. When you start beefing with Drake, you want to release the statics, right? And then when it starts to die down, I think there was another shoe I think that came out along the same time when I think it started to die down. They might have been the sort of like free me. Uh, yeah, there were these ones. They were the kind of the three M, the the fifty two V twos as well. They came out, and I, again, I'm not. Tr- I'm just not sure if that's true or not. I'm not sure if that's a thing. If he's that, I wouldn't put it past him, you know, because you know this is kind of what we're talking about. But that would be a bit fucked up, right? If he's kind of using mental health, talking about threats to his family, accusing people of maybe putting a hit on him or his family. And he's releasing shoes, right? Because remember, in those, in those, in that flurry of tweets, right? Do you remember him saying something along the lines of like, "Oh, Drake, cut the tough guy talk. If anything happens to me, you're the first suspect." Like that is nuts, mate. If if that's not dry snitching, I don't know what is. What the fuck are you talking about, man? Shut the fuck up. And he kind of he said a similar so he just he did say a similar sort of thing to to Jay Z, right? When that whole thing happened with kim i think or before that or i think maybe for the because she didn't come to wedding or they come to wedding or something along those kind of lines i remember he mentioned something on the stage about oh um uh don't send your shooters after me jay-z don't send your shooters something like that like loud loud on stage like you know like what the fuck are you doing Kanye? so i, I don't know again it's a theory I don't, i'm not sure i haven't really thought that much more into it but it's something i've seen floods on the internet i thought i'd mention but it would be a really fucked up if that was the case if one of my musical heroes was you know consistently trolling in an effort to shift his shoes that aren't selling as well as they are uh, if you believe the reports that were released about the sales of the Yeezys and stuff well I'm not I'm not really convinced about people have a people don't have that moral compass though. that's the thing that I have to think people don't really realise like with the UFC thing with John Jones would pop in again right if you really wanted the change and you really wanted uh, a change in maybe management and you wanted Dana White rid to get out of the UFC and wanted someone else a professional outfit to come and actually run it properly you would just not buy the pay-per-views. You would, you know, as a fan, you would not attend, right? You wouldn't buy the pay-per-views. You wouldn't follow the media. You'd make a, a concerted effort. You'd kind of start a hashtag. You, you'd do something in order to kind of show, no, enough's enough. But people don't do that. If they do do it, they do it only for like a week, if that. So I don't believe that people have the, the moral compass that would allow them not to buy Kanye shoes because they don't agree with your political opinion, their political point of view, or they don't believe with, they don't believe they don't believe that his intention that his his intentions are pure when he gets mentioning health mental health issues. They wouldn't do it. It'd be very difficult for them to separate that the kind of the you know the artist and his artwork. I think they'll still lap it up. If Yeezys came on sale, they'll be sold out in an instant. So I don't know. I'm not too sure that's actually true. I know there's. I know people always use the 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 Yeezy 700s as an example. Oh, look, they're not shifting. But I think. As a model, anyway, they're not popular. People don't like the free the the seven hundreds as much as they like the three fifties. It's just not a popular shoe. People just don't like that model. They look too dad shoey, kind of. I think for the most part, um, you can still pick up probably a pair of the Mo three seven hundreds for quite a regular, quite a reasonable price, like three fifty. I'm sure the statics might go maybe for a little bit more because a few of the fucking uh, famous kind of uh, social media influencer guys were wearing them previously with them coming out. So maybe they might be a little bit more expensive than the regular ones. But 700s aren't a good example because they always look, look, oh, look, look, 700, you can still buy them now. And 350s too aren't a good example because there have been so many colorways of them. But I think overall, they do sell out. They don't hang around that often. You can't just go to end clothing and pick up a pair of Yeezys. They're already gone. Um, so I think overall, um, and Im- imagine the amount of shoes that are on that kind of store. They've got so, they've got a, a gazillion shoes, and Yeezys always sell out. So um, and they ramp up the production too. They increase production. If you follow, um, I think it's uh, Yeezy Mafia. They kind of break down the quantities of how many shoes have made per colorway. They get back the kind of inside information. They make far more Yeezys than they did in the past. Far more, and they and they still sell out. So and people that have Yeezys, people that buy Yeezys, don't, it's not like their first pair, they usually have one already in their collection, so you know, it's amazing how they be able to do that but I, I don't know if it's true, if, it, that if he is doing a controversy to release more shoes, if he is, there's a scumbag move, and if he if he is, I won't be surprised too, because you know I think nowadays in the social media age that we live in now, people will do anything to garner some sort of potential, some kind of vir- virality, virality online right, is that a word, virality to be viral, virality, I don't know somewhere Somewhere in there could be a word. Who knows? Um, oh my, God, my coffee's really getting cold as well. Um, what's next on here? Um, talking about Kanye, Don C and Remy Martin. Oh yeah, so Don C, um, 
launched a collaboration with Remy Martin. Um, it looks like, um, and I just I just put this next to each other because you know Kanye was on that radio station crying that he hasn't got his real friends around him, and it doesn't seem like they made it. I don't know. Maybe we background information. We don't know anything that's happening behind the scenes, but it doesn't sound like it doesn't seem as if from you know because Kanye keeps tweeting screenshots of text messages with friends that are saying that you know they got his back or that they understand his perspective and shit but they don't agree you know he's always he's always showing people look 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 look. i still have friends still have friends so if this happened i think we would, we would have known by now or maybe don't see Tony pacific, uh, pacifically like don't tweet or don't screenshot our conversation i don't want anything getting out there but so far we haven't heard anything we haven't heard of them reconciling we haven't heard them coming together if anything the distance has kind of increased it's radio silence of don't see side he hasn't said nothing kind of said nothing and kind of went a race session and cried about that shit man I know people cry all the time. I know that. So I remember Kim Cameron that kind of, you know, cold heartedly saying that when Jim Jones went up to Hot 97, it's like crying that they weren't as close as they would, as they could be. And then Cameron let us know that, you know, Jim Jones is a bit of a cryer anyway. He's like that as a person. He gets emotional. But Kanye isn't that kind of dude. He doesn't cry all the time, right? I don't, I don't think so. Um, he was quite upset that he didn't have his real friends around him. He was quite upset that maybe he kind of joined them away. And so far, we haven't had, we haven't really heard anything um, that's happened so far behind it. But, uh, Don C seems to be thriving, seems to be living a good life, and he kind of uh, released a collaboration with uh, Remy Martin recently. Um, they kind of all dress the same, though, which is funny. I've got the picture here. They kind of have, even though they don't talk to each other, they have they kind of have the same sort of dress style, though. No? No, that kind of baggy long sleeve with the obscure graphic on it, the pants, the way the trainers drop, the kind of standing, the kind of how the arms are postured. They have the same sort of like you know uh, how the, the way the way they kind of just like drop shit. It's all the same sort of way, but it looks quite cool. Um, Kyrish would done the same as humans, so a lot of people there, a lot of cool people. That's what activation. It's just funny the the kind of people that you see at uh, US act US kind of store launches, right? Look at these girls on a, on a settee. All ten out of tens, all dime pieces, like look fucking amazing. Heels, cute dresses, makeup, hair, amazing. They probably smell fucking. They probably smell like Sephora, right? Amazing. You never get that shit at a fucking uh, store launch in London. You remember? Did you like? Do you remember the old school Carhartt fucking store launch things they did or Maharishi back in the day? Well, you never see girls. Like, if they, I mean, like, you, you put a girl like that in a Mahishi store launch, that's like putting a drop of blood in a pool full of piranhas, man. Do you know what I mean? Everyone will be chomping at them. This is not just like a regular schmegler. It's weird how different it is <laughs> than the UK. They look fucking amazing. Um, yeah, so a collaboration with Remy Martin. you got the basketball tops here with Remy and 17. They look quite cool. you got uh, DJ, uh, what's his name? Is it AM? What's his face? Playing as well uh, from Fool's Gold. DJ there, which was quite cool. Uh, you got the Remy bottles there. I'm not, I don't think I've actually had a, some Remy Martin. I've not actually tasted any of it, which looks quite cool. Da, 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 da. Uh, just Justin Remy limited edition Remy Martin. Oh, it's a jersey. It's not. It's not a bottle of. Okay, it's not. It's not a jersey. It's not a bottle. Really? Made of black lambskin leather. The jersey features Remy seventeen and thirty eight detailed in gold lambskin leather and red stitching. A gold woven Remy. Just Remy. Uh, jock tag. Uh, on the front and marks the jersey of her It's seven fifty dollars. Was it made of lambskin leather? Jesus Christ! So it's not actually the bottle of Remy they're selling. It's just the jersey. Okay, fair enough. But they have they have a kind of a bespoke Remy Martin menu, right? A Justin Remy Chicago Don courtside and just Remy Ginger. Jesus Christ! That's mad, isn't it? Just the jersey. That is crazy. Okay, seven fifty. Okay, fair enough, man. Looks cool though. Um, so yeah, congrats to Justin, Don C, and all those guys. I think even if they're not friends, I think there's it has to be eternal gratitude for what Kanye has done for those dudes, isn't it? Overall, when it comes from when it when it's when it comes to Virgil, when it comes to John C, when it comes to Ivan Jasper, dude, when it comes to all the other guys involved in that crew, he kind of gave all of them a career, right? All of them a kind of a creative lane that they can kind of pursue that has nothing to do with Kanye West. I think that's something that you can never, ever, 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 ever take for granted. You always have to be grateful for that. Regardless if they fall out and they're not kind of on the same page and they had their kind of, you know, miscommunication or that kind of luck. Or they just, or they just grew apart. You never know as well, you know? Don't see he's kind of just been about his P's and Q's hanging out, you know, doing his thing. You don't really necessarily see him in the mix and stuff. He just hangs around his wife and does his brand right and does his collaborations for the most part so maybe he just doesn't want all that extra noise and he's to be in and around him and as well he's known Kanye since the beginning right so maybe he's just had enough I don't know what's happening there but I think overall I think it, it does needs to be stated you know just how much of a positive influence Kanye's been for their careers overall right 
you give them all a chance. And I think that's something that we're kind of seeing a lot more nowadays with ra- rappers or creators coming up, especially if it's the one solo person. They do try and bring their friends through, right? They do try and have that be a mark of success. They don't want to be the only person in their entourage that's kind of glistening, right? That has all the diamonds on. They want all their friends, even a photographer, to look like they, you know, they, they're getting money. And that's something that kind of probably been a lot, it's probably been quite influential of, about, right? About having a crew, having a clique that everyone's got their own thing going on. They don't have to be rappers, right? They didn't all want to drop a mixtape. Everyone was kind of happy you know, being, being behind the scenes, doing their thing and also getting their money up. So, yeah. Credit to Just Don and launching that Remy collaboration. When's it? Is there any diesel coming out? If you guys want to check it out. Uh, la, 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 la. I don't know. It doesn't say anything, but I'm sure you'll be able to check it out anyway. It's doing my me up. So, it's kind of that my past, but who knows. Google it, man. Find it. Find it. Uh, LOL. Uh, High Snob article. What's this? What up? Why am I? Hello, LOL. High Snob, for the most part, is a pretty garbage website, isn't it? They're most, they're all kind of garbage. Even Hype says it's garbage moments. But it's Hype Beast, just, they just, they just report anything and everything. The, the kind of maybe the quality control isn't the best. They just report anything and everything, right? If kind of, if kind of takes a shit, they'll talk about it, right? But High, high Snob Ad is even worse because they try and do those like complexy Buzzfeedy articles, like ten things you need to make sure you get the sneakerhead girl of your dreams. Like fuck off. So it's usually annoying and then the op-eds the kind of article pieces they 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 write um with some of their writers are even worse so this one is titled please let 2019 be the last year of pointless collaborations which is like you know high snob talking about pointless collaborations like high snob you are pointless what the fuck are you talking about like it just doesn't make any sense right streetwear is streetwear is bought on the bedrock of collaboration that's where it's kind of formed from right the idea that you can take uh, a Haynes beefy tea and screen print your own logo and it is in essence is a collaboration the fact that your friend who also prints t-shirts and you and your dusty bmx gang can come together and make a t-shirt uh, put a party on together book a bunch of djs and 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 design a whole activation behind it is what Treatwear is built upon like pointless collaborations in the in the lexicon of high, high snobiety will never end because that's what streetwear is built upon. And the moment we lose pointless collaboration, is the moment we lose the whole essence of streetwear. It doesn't make any sort of sense. What do they want? They want it to be elevated to the kind of heady heights of fashion. No, it's it's a it's a it's garbage. Fashion collaborations only happen after the fact, right? Ten years after Dr. Martens is cool, fashion starts jumping on Dr. Martens. But when Dr. Martens wasn't cool and wasn't in the cultural zeitgeist, they don't jump on it. They try and make their own fucking dusty version of high-end Dr. Martens and no one buys them. Whereas streetwear brands, they they are direct to consumer and they're of the moment. Whether it's popping right now, we do the collaboration. We launch it right now. Come on, man. Like pointless collaborations. Anyway, I have already read the title. I haven't actually read the article. I don't know whether or not I'm actually off base and they're arguing on a completely different point. But um oh, and guess who writ the article? Guess who writ the fucking article? Guess who writ the article that I didn't like? Huh? Guess who wrote it? Eugene Rabkin from fucking Stars Like Guys. That fucking numpty. Of course it was him. Of course. Hating articles. Let's get it. And of course, they use the worst example. Human Made in KFC, which is not maybe the worst. I think maybe it's quite an actual clever collaboration overall. But here we go. Let's let's read what Eugene Rabkin has to say about points collaboration because I'm sure it's going to be super constructive and very, very positive. Um... I'm, and I'm not I'm not a positive kind of dude. I don't want everything to be positive. Oh, he's to be positive all the time. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, sometimes he does go out of his way to just not like everything that's around him. It's like, what do you want? You Like, it's never going to change. It's not going to change. It's going to continue. Like, the people that he doesn't like, they're going to get older. Their, their taste levels are going to get more refined. They're going to get different jobs, but they're going to still make shit. So he has to what? He's, he's, he's going to have to wait for a whole new generation of people to come around again for him to suddenly fall back in love with fashion. It's like, come on, man. Jog on. Anyway, let me, let me read the article just in case I'm, I'm reading it all wrong. Uh, so this article is titled, point, let's, Please Let 2008 Be the Last Year of Points of Collaborations on High Snobiety. And it starts off saying, if you read this publication, chances are you own something from a collab, a, a shorthand term for a collaboration between two brands. The fact that there is a term called collab already speaks to the significance and omnipresence of collaborations. It seems like there are now at least several collaborations announced every week. Supreme North Face, Polo's Palace, Virgil, Everyone and Their Mother. Again, what? Like, just, just to be snarky for the sake of it. Why does he have to be such a dick? That's what I don't understand. Like, those kind of... Why does he have to be such a dick? Supreme and North Face is probably the worst example to shoot from because that is quintessentially uh, the most perfect collaboration you're ever going to see, right? Um, a North Face, a jacket that's been co-opted by uh, New York heads from, you know, from yesteryear to graffiti to skateboarding. It's kind of, it's been an omnipresent brand. Supreme, one of the most lauded streetwear brands of modern times, 
right? They want to make a, a jacket of, of North Face level quality, but they can't at this current moment, current moment of time. So what better way to do it than to make a collaboration with North Face? That's how, they, that's how the collaboration came about. Polo Ralph Lauren and Palace. Makes sense as well. Even though I don't give a fuck about Palace, it makes complete sense why they'll collaborate with Ralph Lauren. It is kind of right in line with their kind of, you know, um, what do you call it? Luxury chav look, right? It kind of lends itself very well in it. And Virgil Abloh as a, as a creative, collaborating with everyone under the sun, that's what he's meant to be doing. He's all around creative. Plus, that's what you do. You don't just wait around for the perfect collaboration to land in your lap. You collaborate with Ramoa because you do travel quite often. And if you do a collaboration with, with some luggage, you might sell out some luggage, which is fucking weird, right? People selling out luggage isn't a, a standard thing that happens. You collaborate with Evian because, yes, you just can do it. Like, I don't, I don't know. This guy, man. And hey, let's continue. There's nothing wrong with collabs per se. Oh, really? I wouldn't get, get that looking from what you read, right? What you read there. A good collabo can lead to a fresh take on a f tried and true product, take a product out of its comfort zone and create something generally new. It can give a designer a chance to bring home to perspective to another industry or provide access to materials and means production he or she otherwise wouldn't have, which is what Supreme North Face do, which is what most collaborations are all about, right? And also, it's a, it's a way to just put on your friends, man. It's cool. Of course, collaborators have become a vital source of brand image and publicity. Even collaborators don't provide a major revenue source. They bring brand awareness and keep the marketing, publicity, media treadmill going. Uh, not all of us may like it, but such is the consequence of our fast-paced consumerist world. Cool, whatever, right? Uh, many collaborations make sense for reasons outlined above. When, for example, Johnny Tomby brings his brilliant uh, deconstruction skills to Louis Vuitton, sorry, to Levi's product or uh, Chitose Abbey of Sakai to that North Face or Craig Green and Kai and whatever that name is to Montclair, something worthwhile is born. When neighborhood collaboration with Dr. Myers, his bike reefers can closely be aligned to Docs. Uh, there are collaborations that are cringeworthy in their prophetic attempt to chase the millennial customer. But as the number of collaborations in the past couple of years have grown exponentially, they have become more and more indiscriminate, sometimes downright absurd and limitable consequence when the brands begin to run out of options. It's not really a case of running out of options. It's the fact that they are absurd by their very nature, right? Collaborations. Sometimes collaborations work because, you know, there is a mutual uh, mutual love and appreciation between the two brands coming together or the two kind of creative enterprises, two yeah, design studios, whatever it may be. But most of the time, they are quite absurd. You are testing the waters, right? You are kind of hoping that there's going to be some sort of overlap or you're going to be able to introduce your customers from one end to the other end, right? When most kid collaborates with, uh, name your streetwear brand, right? What's to say a Moleskine fan won't think a collaborating with Supreme is a bit cringeworthy, doesn't have any sort of uh, correlation with Moleskine? It's a completely different segment of the population. But the hope is with Moleskin that they're going to have a product that's going to be a little a luxury product. If they do one, well, imagine with Hermes, right? They're hoping that they're going to be able to introduce the Moleskine uh, customer to Hermes. They're hoping the Hermes customer will use to Moleskin, and they're hoping overall they'll be able to elevate their brand to a level of Moleskin or near above. Like they're hoping that's what you're kind of allying yourself to those brands. So by their very nature, they're going to be absurd. That's just how it is. You just have to kind of like, you know, it's it's a uh, what would you say? It's trial by error for the most part, right? There's be the king is Virgil, who I'm sure he hates, not because he's black, but because, you know, he just doesn't agree with the work. I'm sure it's not because he's black. I'm sure. I'm sure it's not. Uh, there's be the king of Virgil, whose greatest achievement is to slap question marks on everything that he can get his hands on. And these days, he gets his hands on everything from Ikea Virgil to Moet Champagne. This is pouring with hate, isn't it? It's just pouring with hate. Again, you cannot like what he does. You cannot like him as a person. But you cannot deny. You cannot deny the guy's output, man. You cannot deny his output. He's earned the right to talk his shit. He's earned the right. Over these last, I don't know, 10 or so years, the amount of things he's put his name to, the amount of stuff that's uh, elevated his position. Because usually what happens, right? You get big. You get given collaborations. They sell out. And then you start to kind of die down a bit. Your, your star starts to dim. People stop to kind of associate themselves with you because... Even though you're hyped, people the consumer doesn't like your things anymore. They don't buy it. It's not selling out, right? That's the kind of the metrics they use, right? It's not getting retweeted as many times as it should be. It's not getting liked. It's not getting shared. It's not getting posted on all the blogs. It's not selling out online. The brands will. The brands are not. They're not. Uh, they're not loyal to you, right? They're only loyal to the the amount of clicks and reach you can an engagement you can kind of garner, and it goes to show that outside of the bubble of the kind of uh, scene critics, right. The general consumer loves what he does. The general consumer is infatuated with the amount of traveling he does. General consumer cares a lot about the fucking silly things wraps in his notebook. The, the general consumer loves his hyperbole when he's standing up on there giving lectures. They love it. They're lapping it up because he. And you know why I know that 
because he keeps getting booked. Because he keeps getting collaborations, he keeps getting given chances, he keeps getting opportunities, and he keeps elevating his station. There was, there was a time when he was DJing in fucking really cheesy Las Vegas clubs and just kind of get into the bag. Now he's, now he's fucking DJing alongside DJ Harvey in Japan. He's obviously getting better at what he's doing. People are obviously thinking, you know what? Hyper Sai, this guy is good. He's good for everyone. He's good because he's good at what he does. He's good because he brings eyes and, and, I don't know, and bodies to this arena. So to kind of dispute that is folly, really. It just shows that you're hating because, again, take away your bias. Take away you don't like him as a person and he chat shit. He's not talented. He's not a designer. Okay, I get it. But just look at the output. Look at the output and look at the chances he's being given. You don't get given the chances he gets without being good at what you do. That's something everyone has to realize. You don't get that opportunity and you don't consistently hit out of the park too. You know what I mean? All the time, bang, 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 smash out of the park if you're not good at what you do. But again, if you're Eugene Rebkin from Style Zeitgeist, guys, you hate everything that's around nowadays because the people don't look like you, right? They don't, they don't wear the stuff that you wear, they don't listen to the music that you listen to, and you hate it. And they're at the forefront, they're leading the charge, right? Raph Simmons re recently uh, got I don't know, left uh, Calvin Klein or got fired, regardless of what you believe or the rumors on the scene. But, you know, look at the difference. He was somebody that was kind of sniping at Virgil, saying that, you know, he hates his work and he doesn't want to be compared to him and he's leaps and bounds above it. Okay, cool. No worries. But what's going on? Nowadays, what's happening now? Jamie, you know I mean? it's like, these guys, man, I don't know. I, 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 would, I, I would like to think if I was in that position, I would be welcoming. Like, I'd be like a John Galliano. He's got an amazing podcast um, with uh, Mesa of Mesa Margiela recently that I think tied in with the uh, recent shows where he kind of uh, talks about his creative process. It's fucking mesmerizing. I'll try and, if I try and find a link, I'll try and find a link and post it on the show description. But an interview with uh, John Galliano talking about his, uh, you know, his kind of uh, rebirth at Mesa Marcia Margiela. And he was talking about the kind of current climate nowadays, right? In fashion shows, on the runway shows. Talking about, you know, Virgil debuting at Paris, uh, Ricardo Tichy at Burberry, uh, Kim Jones at Dior, right? New energy coming in, people moving houses, like everyone coming to Paris, right? Everyone stepping up their game. And he kind of said that it's adding, it's kind of adding more fuel to his creative energies, right? He kind of feels inspired again because of all these guys are around. He kind of wants to show, he said what he wants to do. He can't do what they do. He can't do the street stuff. He's going to just concentrate on tailoring. He didn't say tailoring's back as like a weird little kind of dog whistle in terms of trying to get out, get the streetwear out of, out of the scene, right? To kind of dis, you know, dismiss the streetwear because it's not something that you like. He didn't say that. He said they can do the streetwear stuff. They can ace that, but I can do this fashion shit really well. And he's rising to the challenge. The last couple of collections for Mason Marcin Margiela from the fucking diffusion lines and stuff that you see on the runway is insanely good. Why is it? Because John Gallagher re recognized the competition on the scene and he rose up to it. Instead of complaining, he didn't complain like this Ruji Rebkin does and bemoan that it's not how it used to be. He saw what's happening out there. He, you know, and he kind of raised his game because of it. <laughs> Anyway, it continues. Uh, but even brands are hold in high regard, like Japan's neighborhood. Of course, you hold your uh, neighborhood in, again. What? Because it's Japanese. You could argue, has neighborhood done anything new in the last five or so years? Have they done anything new? Has Dabutep done anything new? No. But you like it. Why? Because they've been around longer and they're Japanese. Like, often produce uh, eyebrow raising collabs. What is the point of neighborhood in Adidas? Well, what is the point of neighborhood in Billionaire Boys Club? What's the point of neighborhood in J Crew? Yes, you read right, J Crew. I tried to imagine the client uh, for the latter, a low-level marketing executive who rides a Harley on Sundays, a hires angel in touch with his in a gentrifier. Like Jesus Christ, man, this guy hates everything. It's so funny to see. He broke my nose. Um, and what to make of the collaboration between the Hundreds and Andrew Lloyd Webber or Broadway Music Fame? In the May 2018 post on their Facebook page, 100 posters they follow in bombastic statements. Streetwear without culture is just fashion. Right? But is the musical cats is the musical cats uh in in but if the musical cats is the kind of culture you are aligning yourself with, you are turning streetwear into fashion with a level of gusto that would make Walt Disney green with envy. The larger point here is the same one that goes for the entire world of fashion. Streetwear is included. The loss of any culture meaning that hap uh, uh cultural meaning that happens when context is removed until everything becomes more mere What is that? Let's go again. The loss of any culture meaning the, the loss of the loss of any cultural meaning that happens when context is removed until everything becomes mere surface. It is the point of contention exactly when colors begin to consume the world 
but there is somewhat of a consensus that the point of departure was with the first H&M collaboration, the one with Carlisle in 2004. He's, geez, he's still complaining about this. God almighty. The publicity hur- hurricane is unleashed with long lines of harried customers descending on H&M flagship in a downright feeding frenzy trying to get a piece of that highly questionable call was a very eye- was an eye-opener for everyone in the fashion world. Yeah, it was an eye-opener because they kept repeating that formula, man. It made them a lot of money. And it also exposed a whole group of people to Karl Lagerfeld uh, products that they probably weren't able to expose to. And the hope is that you buy into H&M and then you suddenly work your way up the food chain. That's the hope. It probably doesn't happen because if you're going to buy H&M Karl Lagerfeld, you're probably just going to stay with that anyway. But the hope is that it's like a, it's like a sales funnel, right? They want to get you at the top of the funnel and then kind of slowly but surely pass you down. That's the hope. H&M went collaborative... Um, Went on to collaborate with everyone from Barmaid to Comme des Garçons. Still one of my favorite collaborations ever. Like, that Haitian collaboration was so good. Uh, still some stuff that I really wanted to do with it. Ray Kyle Kuba later expressed regret at having done it. I'm sure I'm sure she regrets it enough to, to give back the money that she got paid for it. You think so? I don't think so. Um, to most recently, Machino. Other match chains at Target got into the game as well, as did Sportswear Giants. The story here was clear. Democratization of fashion, mass stage exclusivity. Uh, ob- ostensibly but not so really as all these collaborations were produced in limited numbers and even no but it doesn't shut up Eugene they are trying there is democratization right there are more H&M stores out there right then there are Balmain or Comme des Garçons stores there are it just is and there's more quantity of items that they sell between the with all those put together I'd, I'd even I'd even I'd even garner that one fucking H&M store probably stocks more items in their store has probably more SKUs than any than all barmaid stores combined right it just is what it is right because most runway items don't even make it to the fucking store in the most for the most case right if they don't get bought by the buyers in the showroom they don't make it <laughs> So they are democratizing fashion because they're allowing everyone to buy into Balmain. And the hope is, it's a hope, it's a fucking naive hope, but the hope is you buy into H&M and Balmain and then over a period of time, you will then start thinking, you know what, maybe I should back up Balmain mainline. Maybe I should get a bit of that. And you kind of work your way up. That's the hope of it. That's the hope. Anyway, the article continues, you know, he's talking his nonsense, but yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It just surprises me that someone could be this, like, I don't know, this, this, um, this, no, I say, um, we say disattached. I guess maybe he's, he, he's intentionally, you know, not aware of what the client, current climate is of fashion or what it means to sell commercial products and stuff. He wants to kind of be in the, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'll link the article in the show so you can check it out yourself. But it's called Please Let 2019 Be the Last Year of Points Collaboration. Eugene Rapkey's hating on everything once again. It's interesting. I like it because it makes me, it fires me up and gets me speaking about things passionately and defending everything. Because I think it's amazing. I think now that we live in the best best possible time, man. Like the gatekeepers are finally gone. Eugene Rapkey can't, you don't, need, you don't need to get Eugene to post something for you on social or on a website, on an online magazine anymore. You can just upload it yourself. You don't need a gatekeeper. You don't need him to validate what you're doing anymore. And I think that really wrangles really deeply with people like him, with, with a person like an Ebro, Hot 97, all those kind of dudes, right? That kind of person, right? That kind of temperament, they're bemoaning the... the the yesteryears when the the creatives that were coming up were going to them for guidance, were kind of seeking approval, right? Were asking, "Hey, what do you, what do you think of this track, man? Hey, what do you think of this collection? Do you think I should put? What do you think of how how I put this lapel on this jacket?" They were asking for it, but now they don't need it anymore. They just go directly to their customers and ask them, "Hey, we're making a new jacket. Do you want a hood on it or not? Vote on Instagram." Or whatever you want to do, they can read the comments. They can respond to emails. Like they don't need, they don't need that communication with the with the Chris anymore because they can just con- communicate to people that are actually supporting what they do. They're flipping customers, the fans of their work, the fans of them as a person. They don't need them anymore. So I think that is what kind of really grates these kind of people in their head. Like, oh, I'm not a gatekeeper anymore. People don't need my people don't need my approval. How now can I reinvent myself? And now he's reinvent himself, kind of being some I don't know some fucking bootleg Kathy Horn. And he's now complaining about issues in the streetwear and fashion. Let's just sh- shut the fuck up. Points collaboration. That's what. That's the whole point of of streetwear. If you don't like the collaboration, you just pass. You just keep keep it moving. The Bape and fucking Puma thing that they put out recently that is fucking garbage. I just keep it moving. It's not for me. I just keep it moving. Bape has died ever since Nigo left. I keep it moving. I don't complain and say, oh, uh, why are people still buying Bape now? It's fucking shit. There's still pieces in it that are still good. If they like it, they like it. I keep it moving. There's loads of brands out there. I keep it moving. I keep it moving. There's so many brands to choose from. Keep it moving. 
What is he going to do? Sit there in his fucking Boris, whatever that name is, and Rick Owens' trousers, uh, hoping that the climate changes and he can suddenly step out and become cool again. You're cool anywhere as you are, man. You don't need to like wait for the right, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, hue of person to come around that you agree with. Dog whistles, man. Absolute dog whistles. They're, they're annoyed that the hip-hop guys, all the, all the flipping black guys have come in and fucking taken over. That's what they're annoyed about, right? They they were firstly annoyed that all these all these vapid, um, in their in their eyes, right? S social media influencers took over, right? Um, no one was taking pictures of editors anymore. Everyone's taking pictures of like the people that are wearing the clothes, buying it from the shop, right? So that kind of wrangled them because the the girls that are wearing it didn't necessarily know the history of the brand and all this sort of malarkey. That pissed them off. So the intellectuals kind of got dashed, and now the kind of like cultural and scene and kind of critics and you know, the writers, they're also getting dashed because no one cares. People just keep buying the stuff that they hate, that they're too writing about and they don't get it. They don't understand. But again, the market is the market. If people like your shit and what you're doing is good, it will show. How many, how many things do you have available? You printed 30 t-shirts. How many have you sold? Oh, I've sold one. Okay, that means no one wants what you're making or you haven't found the best way to kind of, you know, uh, distribute your stuff. You don't get it in front of the right people. But overall, the market is a market. If what you're selling is good, people will buy it. Simple. And the fact that this Eugene guy is now having to resort. Imagine what, imagine how he feels, how the ego must feel having to write for hype society. Considering the amount of trash they put out on their website. He's now writing articles about bemoaning the state of flipping collaborations. We don't care what you think anywhere about streetwear. What, why, what, what do we care? You're, you're avant-garde fashion, dude. You wear black. Stay in the lane over there. We don't care. Don't come to our world. We don't want to hear your opinion. We don't. Sorry. We don't want to hear your opinion. When he keeps championing it, imagine. You could argue that the people that he likes are just fucking disciples of fucking Rick Owens, right? You could, you know, you could probably swap out the logos. You couldn't tell what was Rick Owens' piece. They're just flipping copying everything that Rick Owens does. What unique voices are coming out from that world, for the most part, apart, uh, apart from soloist? What's the, what's the real unique voices coming out from that world, apart from undercover? What's really unique that's coming out from that side on Stars Like Guys? Nothing, man. It's all fucking copycats of Rick Owens. And then here he comes, coming in the streetwear, telling us what, what is cool and why we should not do collaborations. Jog on. Jog on, man. Jog on. Anyway, that might be a good place to end it. Um, instead of getting uh, too worked up about something that doesn't really matter in the main sense of it. But anyway. This is Jackson Zinger Show, episode number 136. Thanks so much for tuning in with me, your host, Agostina. As always, this podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audible, Audible, Audible. Uh, I've got a little link kind of below in the description, so give that a click and um, let me earn some dollars so I can buy more books for myself because I've been doing that quite often, which has been very helpful. Thank you for those that have been clicking it. Um, it's helped me buy a couple of audio books over the new year, which I'm mean, over the end of the year, which I'm going to uh, debut or let you know about in the new year. Um, it's audible.com for just Aggie to claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial. As always, 400 over over 400,000 titles to choose from. Some narrated by the author themselves. You can check that out and you can get an audio book to soup, to, to, to soup up your reading abilities before the end of the year. Um, I'm also uh, DJing, as I mentioned before, on Friday at Tapped and uh, on Saturday for Labatees, my night at Heathcote Star. You can find all the links to that uh, available in the show notes too. Go on my website, www.agostinozinger.com. Click DJ Gigs and all my listings are on there. Um, again, I'll probably see you guys before the end of the week. I'm assuming I'll try to do one more before New Year's Day. I think that'd be nice just to kind of say that I did well in 2018. Yes, yeah, so that'd be quite nice. But before, if I don't see you then, I guess have a happy new year. Enjoy yourself. Um, hang out. If you're not going to go out and get crazy, just hang out with your friends. Just chill out. Order, order, order a pizza. Get high. And have a good time, right? Get a bit tipsy, have some drinks, and that's it. You don't need to go out anywhere and go crazy, right? If you're not going to go, there's no need to do that. Um, don't don't kind of kill yourself just for one day. Um, it's, and it's cold out there too. It's fucking cold outside. So, yeah. Anyway, this has been the Exodus Show, episode number 136. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you listen via the audio podcast, you hear a nice little outro song to kind of uh, be the soothe you out. If you're watching via YouTube, it will just end abruptly. But before that ends, give me a like, give me a subscribe, share, you know, all that nice stuff for the um, algorithms out there. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Peace.